Part of what makes a politician successful is his or her ability to convince you that they're trustworthy and authoritative. Would it surprise you to learn that studies show we equate trustworthiness and authoritativeness with lower voices? Karen Stintz learned that when she was in local politics in the provincial capital from 2003 to 2014. And she joins us now for more. Great to see you again. Thank you, Steve. Thanks nice for to coming be here. in. My pleasure. When did you first become aware of this notion that higher voices were somehow seen as less, author less authoritative, rather, in politics? When I read an, a column, actually, about the fact that I wasn't a good communicator because of the way I spoke. How long ago was that? It was, I'm going to guess, 2007. It's a long time ago. Yeah, John Barber actually wrote about it in his column. Because John Barber, former Globe Mail former columnist. Former Globe Mail columnist. So you're on city council at the time. Yeah. And did you have any reason to believe that you weren't? Communicating well? It was the first feedback that I'd received that I wasn't as effective as I could be because of the way I spoke. What was it about the way you spoke? I spoke quickly. I had a, and when I was trying to convey and be passionate on an issue, I tended to raise my voice and it came across as shrill. And so what I was saying was drowned out by the way I was saying it. And I, again, until I read it, I didn't realize that that was the effect I was having. Now, shrill is a word they never use with men. No. Shrill is a word only used for women. So yes. when you read that, did you think, man, that's sexist? No, actually, I read that I need to change. Huh. I didn't read it with sexist at all. I felt that it was a, an opportunity for me to improve how I was communicating. Because being in politics, you, you're there because you want to make a difference and you need to convince people and you have a message that you want to deliver. And I realized I wasn't as effective as I could be. And it had not occurred to you before that that you had a problem communicating. No, and when I went, when I had uh, hired someone to help me, uh, I learned that uh, politicians, female politicians from across the continent, actually had undergone the same exercise. Margaret Thatcher was uh, took, took speech lessons for a large part of her career so that she could be seen to be more authoritative and more uh, uh, more of a leader. Hmm. It's hard to imagine that the woman they called the Iron Lady was ever yeah. seen as anything less than authoritative. Yeah. But apparently, no, she's the most famous example of someone who went to voice coaching. Yes. Huh. yes. Okay, so you've got it in your mind at this point now that you've got to do something to, I guess, lower the timbre of your voice. Is that the idea? Well, it, it was really about how do I improve the way I speak. And there was a, quite a bit I actually didn't know about public speaking. Hmm. And one of the interesting learnings for me was not just the tone and pitch at which you speak, but the speed. And an interesting feedback was that people who speak quickly tend to leave the impression that they're not listening. John Tory speaks faster than anybody I know. Yeah. Does he give the impression that he's not listening? I, I mean, I wouldn't want to make an opinion on behalf of others, mm -hmm. but certainly that's what I learned, in that uh, when you speak really quickly, even though you are listening and you're, you're hearing and you're trying to formulate a response to what you're hearing, the audience or the individual is left with the impression that you don't matter. Hmm. And as a politician, that's a very, very dangerous place to live <laughs> if you think that, <laughs> if you leave your constituency with the impression that they don't matter. Hmm. Well, should I remind you that four and a half years ago you ran for mayor of Toronto? I did, yes. You did. <laughs> Thank you. No, you don't need to remind me of that. <laughs> uh, it didn't end the way you wanted, but I bet there were some interesting aspects of it yes. that were a good experience. Yes. You want to hear what you sounded like back then? Uh, sure. Okay. Thank Watch you. Watch the monitor over there, and Sheldon, <laughs> if you would, here's Karen Stins from four and a half years ago. I am worried that we could end up with a, a, a pendulum swing back to an NDP government, and I don't want that. I think we had seven years of that, and I think the city spoke loudly against that. So I look forward to a campaign that is fiscally responsible, but also delivering on the priorities of the city. If we can afford to invest in projects like the downtown relief line without having to rely on property tax. We are, I believe, a united city. The experience of living north of the 401 is very different than living south of the 401, and I think that is real. We need to be able to bring transit and economic opportunities to all areas of our city, and that's what I intend to do. Now, that's a post-voice coached Karen Stintz. How is that different from the pre-voice coached Karen Stintz? I, again, not having the benefit of the pre-Karen <laughs> Stintz, there is no question that I, I talked much faster. and that I Before this? Before this, yeah. And, and even I got feedback that even after my coaching, I still spoke too quickly uh, for people to want to pay attention to what I was saying. Hmm. And it was, there was no question that when I became interested in, about an issue or passionate about an issue that I, I would raise my voice. Sometimes when I speak too quickly, I say to people, this sounds really arrogant and I guess I mean it sort of funny. I say, I'm not speaking too quickly, you're listening too slowly. I guess you can't say that as a politician, No, can you? No, that <laughs> no. doesn't work. <laughs> no. So what did the voice coach actually have you do? 
There was, uh, uh, again, that exercise of watching myself and... Uh, watching tapes of yourself? Watching tapes of myself, okay. watching tapes of other speakers, uh, figuring out what, it, what I aspired to be like as a speaker, and also just practice, 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 and writing something that was important to me and then taking time to go through it. And the other part was uh, being prepared about what I wanted to say. And that was another part of being um, more calm in your delivery, is being more confident in what you want to say. And that was another learning, because oftentimes you're under the pressure of the media and you need to provide a response or a mm -hmm. comment. And if you're not ready or you're not, you don't know what you want to say, you're going to come across as either uninformed, shrill, or not impactful. Hmm. Are, are you consciously right now trying to speak more slowly and in a lower voice? I am. You are consciously trying to do it? Yes, because when oh. I'm talking to my kids, I speak quite differently. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you don't treat me like one of your kids, I guess. That's a nice thing. No. Did, did the voice coach ever give you breathing lessons or that kind of thing? No, I think it was more uh, getting into the mind of how do you calm yourself? How do you figure out how, what, what do you need to do to calm down? And, and what did you need to do? And I think it was breathing. I think it was thinking about, you know, where a, a calm place. All those techniques that you do to, to, to get yourself centered. How about, did, like, did you get on the floor and do these kind of breathing exercises? No, that kind of no, stuff? never you didn't that. Do that. No. Because I've seen some people, yeah. you know, coach that way. Yeah. You didn't have to do that. I didn't have to do that. D did the coaching actually work? I think it worked. I, it was controversial at the time. I don't know if you recall. I was I, on the front page of the Star. I, uh, well, I, I wasn't going to raise it, but since yeah. you have, I mean, I, I, th I think you used your, your politician's budget to help pay for the lessons. It wasn't very much money, but you did, and you took a lot of flack for doing that. Was yes. that fair in your view? I, I didn't believe it was fair mm -hmm. because I had an office budget that was intended to help in my role as a politician, and it was a $65,000 office budget that could be spent on things like voice coaching. Whatever, yeah. yeah. And I, I felt I, I was singled out because Adam Giambroni spent the same amount of money on French lessons. That was one of your colleagues on council. Correct. And he spent it on French lessons. Correct. And yeah. I couldn't figure out why I was taking slack for voice coaching and he wasn't getting scrutinized for French lessons because it was the same amount of money out of the same office budget and I spent less that year. How much? I mean, it was less than 10% of your office budget, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. 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 But it, I will say it discouraged me from taking further coaching lessons because I didn't want to be under that kind of scrutiny for trying to improve my skills. What conclusion did you come to about why he seemed to skate on it and you got really tough coverage on it? I concluded that because it was demonstrating an ambition that I was holding, that the star was scrutinizing and questioning. Because if I was trying to become a better speaker and a better communicator, it must mean that I have designs beyond counsel. And we don't like women with ambition in politics, do we? No, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of that out there, isn't there? Yeah, it was hard. It was hard to see, and it was hard to... And it, it, it was actually quite interesting because my community didn't react that strongly. There was a couple when I knocked on doors in the next election. There was a couple questions about it. But by and large, I, it wasn't that controversial in my community. But yet, it, it, I, don't, I, I was quite surprised it warranted front page above the fold in the Toronto Star. Hmm. Did others notice, after you took the lessons, that your voice was different? I don't know. I, th I think, you know, you, once you realize that you have this issue, you overcompensate. So I think I went to a point, actually, on council where I, I was speaking so slow, my <laughs> colleagues fell asleep. But it, so there was a point at which they, they, you know, and it was in the star, so they knew I was trying to do this. And I think it does take time and practice and and sustained effort hmm. to, to, to be an effective communicator. And I, I think that the pendulum may have swung too far the other way until I actually got more comfortable. Do you recall anybody coming up to you, though, and saying, Karen, you're, you're, you're sounding far more authoritative than you ever used to? No. That didn't no. happen? No. Okay. I got the reverse, though. Which I did. Was... I did get, you still talk too fast. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Even after the coaching, yeah. the practicing, and yeah. all of that. And do you think you talk too quickly? Sometimes, I do. Um, and How about right now? But probably a little bit because, again, it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to talk about this. But, you know, I think that, um, you know, especially when you get excited or you're enthusiastic or you are, you know, in the moment, uh, yeah. I, I think, you, you know, naturally personality types tend to talk quickly hmm. and extroverts talk quickly. They do. And it's, it, it's just part of who we are. And extroverts tend to be involved in politics and women tend to have this as an opportunity for them to figure out how they want to manage. Well, here's the $64,000 question, which is given that men's voices tend to be lower than women's voices, 
do you, and, and apparently studies say we attribute more authority to lower voices, do you think men have a built-in advantage over women when it comes to this? I do. I, I really do. And I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't want to attribute it to any kind of sexism by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I do think that when a man is speaking in an authoritative tone, he commands the audience in the room and can deliver a message more effectively. Hmm. And what do we do about that? Because that seems kind of unfair. Well, unfair or not, I, I think it's just something we need to acknowledge. And, and, and my personal view is not spend time talking about whether it's sexist or not. It is. Not, I'm not saying it is sexist. It is just a reality. Hmm. So in supporting female politicians, help them to become effective communicators so that they can be able to deliver their message and have it be received in the same way that a man can. Okay, I want to understand this, because is, is, is part of the solution here that everybody needs to change their idea of what constitutes authoritativeness in a voice, or do higher speaking people need to learn how to speak in a lower voice? Personally, mm. I think it's more reasonable to expect higher speaking people to learn how to speak in a lower voice than it is to change the masses on their understanding what it means to be authoritative or leader, a leader. Because that kind of cultural change is probably just not on. It's, I just don't think it's gonna happen. And when we get to the critical mass point of 25% or 30% of women being represented in politics at every level, you know, maybe we can have that discussion. But there is no question that even when I was going through the voice coaching, there was a lot of lessons just around communicating that I think everyone can benefit from. Hmm. Did you ever have this conversation with any of your female colleagues on council when you were there? No, I didn't. I didn't. Because when I started at council, I was one of the few right of leaning, right of center female counselors. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have many close colleagues. Towards the end, um, there were, you know, Anna got elected, Mary Margaret got elected. But at mm -hmm. the beginning, I really didn't have many female colleagues well, I could rely on. Most of the female city councilors were on the left. Yeah. You would not be caucusing with them ahead of time. Um, Okay, this is fascinating. So, um, what now? <laughs> I think I like to. I like that I'm bringing light to this mm -hmm. in a, in a way that I think is uh, legitimate because I'm not in politics anymore. So it's not about me and my political career. Mm -hmm. It's about an issue that I think women in politics can benefit from, and and I think more women should because I think we do need more leadership, and I think that too often we don't have the benefit of what female politicians are saying because of the way they say it. Hmm. Well, I must confess, this was not on my radar screen until you wrote about it and I read your piece, so I thank you for doing that, and I thank you for coming into TVO tonight to talk about it. Thank you, Steve. That's Karen Stintz, who's the CEO of Variety Village, a former mayoralty candidate in the city of Toronto and city councillor. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.